centuries to mm -hmm. look at the issues facing women and see how helpful meditating, having mm -hmm. a spiritual practice has been to free them from the impediments of their culture, from the lack of freedom they had. I see it very applicable to today's women who are in, in a certain way imprisoned by the image of beauty, mm -hmm. imprisoned by the expectation, and how helpful it is to have some deeper practice, some connection to a source through religion, spirituality, through philosophy, some way of saying, wait a minute, this mm -hmm. is like a cartoon. I don't need to play this part. Right. Right. Well, now, how is um, Western society uh, accepting uh, Buddhism? Uh, uh, is it welcoming? How, what are you finding? Well, I think that, that this is in part um, uh, a responsibility for us, mm -hmm. too. For example, um, as a priest in my tradition, formally I have to have a shaved head. Mm -hmm. But I don't shave my head because I think I have to make the adaptations mm -hmm. to make Zen seem like it's not weird mm -hmm. how weird would it be or people get concerned when they see me when I do shave my head for ceremonies they get concerned that I'm having chemotherapy it mm -hmm. means something different in our culture so how it is we as Buddhist practitioners take on the practice of kindness patience mm -hmm. giving people attention rather than making ourselves different or weird right. this is a very important part of whether we're going to be welcomed or not exactly exactly do you see um, western religions incorporating some of the buddhist practices into their uh, teachings yes they are mm -hmm. because all of the uh, religions have as their basis either prayer or meditation mm -hmm. some communication with the source of our life mm -hmm. something very deep and uh, also, I believe that they don't want to lose people who are either Jewish. I see it in mm -hmm. my grandchildren's Hebrew school that they're teaching yoga and meditation mm -hmm. as part of their Hebrew training because they want to say it's included in mm -hmm. Judaism so that the, my grandchildren, uh, in, in the view of the Hebrew teachers, don't have to go outside of Judaism. So I believe that they're incorporating um, uh, more emphasis on meditation because mm -hmm. it's in the culture now, particularly mindfulness. Right, right. So um, are you seeing, uh, is, and it sounds like I'm hearing a difference between uh, Buddhist men and, and then Buddhist uh, women. Mm. You know, talk about those differences because it, it, it I'm hearing a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, in the, in the uh, Asian countries, um, it seems that they're very separated. The men practice uh, are segregated and, and segregated geographically from the women's practice, and the women are not in the same way empowered and don't have their own temples, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. In the West, it's very much equal. This is the first time that Buddhist men and women have practiced under the same roof, and so some of the values that women have for relationship, for family, for taking care of other people is rubbing off in general on Western Buddhism. And we're seeing more of a connected, uh, married clergy that feels that it, uh, the, even the husband, if he's a Zen priest, mm -hmm. feels that being involved with his children and his family is part of his practice. This is part of the influence of women having uh, full access to Buddhism mm -hmm. in the West. They're affecting it. So is Western uh, Buddhism, the practice of Buddhism in Western, is, uh, is that uh, sh uh, kind of uh, sh uh, frowned upon by um, the uh, masters? Mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, what we see, certainly in China after the Cultural Revolution, Buddhism was kind of wipe, wiped off mm -hmm. the map. So it became, uh, it carried over into Taiwan from mm -hmm. China. In Japan, uh, they tend to be, um, losing influence mm -hmm. and so they look to the West mm. and the changes we're making and say well you know they're more connected mm. you know maybe in Japan all the priests do is conduct funeral ceremonies now so you know they're looking at some of the things we're doing as a way of saying maybe we can reinvigorate our practice mm -hmm. I don't think that they're frowning upon it at all okay. they're really seeing in the history of Buddhism it went from India to China to Japan to the West or th through Korea as well and every time Buddhism uh, goes to a different country, it changes, mm -hmm. but it stays alive. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the part that's interesting to people in Asia and the masters in Asia is, look, 
The Westerners are interested in it. They're mm -hmm. doing it their way. We don't want them to change the basics, but we're mm -hmm. they're very heartened by the way we love our practice. Wow. Now, the principles and the philosophies, I mean, they're well over thousands of years old. Why do you think that it's taken so long for um, a lot of this to come to the Western states or Western society and, and and be more accepted. When you think in terms of the, the principles and the concepts and the theories are, are so powerful yeah. and they make so much sense, why did it take so long? Well, I think it's just about travel, you know, mm -hmm. air travel and so on. The, um, the teachers that came over, first came over on boats, right, at the end of the 19th century. They came over mm -hmm. on boats to participate in the uh, religious conferences. But, uh, you know, the roots of the West are, are Christian, mm -hmm. really, Judeo-Christian. Mm -hmm. So it's um, not necessarily has been welcomed, but it sort of snuck in during the mm -hmm. 60s, you know, where people were interested in mm -hmm. alternatives, and that's when it really started to gain in popularity. Mm -hmm. So then how can um, women today um, actually learn uh, from some of the... Um, uh, ancestors, and uh, I know you teach, you know, but um, uh, what can they do to really gain some of this wisdom? You know, what I think is most important for women is that they don't get caught by their emotional reactions. Women tend to, as uh, biologists are now showing us, have a more developed emotional part of mm -hmm. the brain, and they tend to believe that. You know, they tend to be able to see through the thoughts a little bit better than the men, but they tend to believe the emotions are true and they get very upset and petty, and particularly with each other. <laughs> so I think that this is an important uh, development for women, learning to meditate, mm -hmm. learning to use spirituality of any mm -hmm. kind, to see that attachment to mm -hmm. emotions does not necessarily help them that much and to um, also see beyond the cultural expectations. And the more they study the history of women and women's development, the more they can mm -hmm. see women are always facing mm -hmm. pretty similar issues. Right, right. Yeah, that is very true. You know? <laughs> very true. We do have some things that we definitely need to work at. <laughs> um, as a Zen teacher, and you are also a uh, psychologist. Yes, I How am. How do you combine that? Because, I mean, that's a very interesting combination. I mean, you're working with two very powerful elements there. How do you combine that in your practice and in your teaching? Well, one of the things um, that I've been working on since I did practice in Japan and say, wow, well, the practice they do is very powerful because mm -hmm. I could feel it in my own mm -hmm. body but it doesn't make sense in our culture. So what is it that I can teach? As a psychologist, I teach people to notice their psychological defenses when they get all stirred up emotionally and to work there. And that's where it overlaps with my psychological work. But when I'm working with um, people in a psychology session, then they're making use of mm -hmm. me and my mm -hmm. mind and uh, thinking about how I would respond to things when they're in a crisis. But when I'm working with students in a Zen tradition, mm -hmm. they, I'm really teaching them how to access a bigger source of mind, a uh, really universal source of mind. So those are two different uh, techniques, but really they're focusing on where do I get caught and what do I do when I get caught in a situation where I feel all tied up in knots. Mm -hmm. And you talk about uh, Zen as a, a, a kind of a meditation, uh, practice of meditation as well. And, and what does that look like for people? How, how does one go about meditating? Well, you know, there are various ways to meditate. And the simplest way is to start paying attention to your breath. You know, when you become agitated, your breath is in your chest and you're breathing more rapidly. And when you calm down, you can bring your breath, you can bring it down into your belly and feel your belly expand and contract and follow the out breath. Mm -hmm. We've been taught in this uh, culture to try to accumulate, so we hold on to everything. And in Zen, we equate that to the inhalation. Mm -hmm. We always want to take something in. So in Zen, we put particular emphasis on the exhalation, the letting go. And there's only two places really that I know of, yoga, and meditation mm -hmm. that really emphasize how do you learn to let go? Mm -hmm. Everything else is teaching you how to hold on. Right, right. And then you mentioned in your practice that you do a quiet 
meditation as opposed to one where you may necessarily have music and incense and all this other surrounding stuff. Mm -hmm. So kind of talk about how that works. Yeah, what, in mm -hmm. the Zen meditation, uh, we bring the mind and the uh, body and the breath to one place and start usually with the counting of the breath and particularly the, the exhalations and we count one to ten each exhalation is a different number and if mm -hmm. we fr lose pl our place and we get stuck on three mm -hmm. we just come back to one we start with each exhalation mm -hmm. um, but some people who are very um, troubled mm -hmm. might not take to that kind of meditation it might be too distant for them so then we can do a metta meditation where they have a prayer where they say may all beings be happy may I be uh, joyous and happy and where they extend mm -hmm. loving kindness and compassion to all beings and make that part of their practice when they're sitting quietly. Right. And so you do have uh, Zen centers and you also lecture and teach yes. and so um, if one, one wants more information about how they could participate or how they could get more information about the, your book, how would they get in touch with you? The best uh, website for me is zenwomen.org zenwomen.org and all my events even the events in Vallejo and the Bay Area are listed on that website. Wonderful so I, I, I tell you Zen Women and how, how quickly how did you come up with the title of your book? Actually <laughs> my title for the book was going to be Broadening Zen because of the uh, mm -hmm. slang term for broad right? <laughs> But my editor did not care uh -huh. for that. And they had all read the book, and so uh -huh. this was uh, a combination of okay. my editor and myself coming up with their alternative to Great. broadening Zen. Great. Well, I tell you, uh, Zen women beyond tea ladies, iron maidens, and macho masters. I, 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 I've had a chance to read through it, and I think it's an excellent book, and uh, certainly would encourage people taking a look at it. And I want to tell you, I thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Very interesting, very interesting, and uh, I think I've learned a lot. Uh, so I really appreciate you being here, and I'd just like to say to all of you, thank you so much for joining us, and until next time, this has been Talk About.